Thank you, Victoria. Good morning. Welcome to worship. This is a time to find solace from the challenges of this past week. It's a time to intentionally connect with each other. And it's a time to listen carefully for the voice of the Father. May we accomplish all of that today as we worship Him together. I invite you to take out your worship guide and join me in reading through our call to worship. It's taken from a selection in Zechariah 9 and Psalm 118. It's a responsive reading. Rejoice greatly, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, even on a donkey's colt. You are our God, and we will praise you. You are our God, and we will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Father, we have gathered here in your presence to worship you with one heart and one voice, and we ask that you would speak to us as your people and change us into who you want us to be. Empower us for the challenges of this week. And would you receive our praise and worship of you as a worthy offering of everything we are. We give this time and ourselves to you in your name. Amen. Well, we do celebrate this morning the love that God has for us. It's a love so amazing that it's worth singing about, and we're going to do that together now. If you would take out your hymnal, that's the red book that you can find underneath of the seat in front of you. And would you turn with me to number 185, 185, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And if you're able, would you stand with me as we sing together this morning?
take out your worship folder inside of that you should find a white insert and that has the words and music to our next song it's called Jesus Messiah Now back in your hymnal, the great Charles Wesley hymn, number 203, and can it be number 203?
This is the work of the remarkable God that we worship today. Missionary Wesley Duell wrote once, the more we praise God, the more we become God conscious and so absorbed in his greatness and his wisdom and his faithfulness and love. Praise reminds us of all that God is able to do because it reminds us of the great things that he's already done. Uh, to praise God is to bless him, but it's also to help us. It helps us remember who he is and what he's done. So we praise him today for who he is and for all that he's done. He has helped several uh, through surgeries and illnesses. Paul Hammond, June Eisman, Joan Lee, there are others. We can give him thanks for that. Uh, he's carried us in our travel some far away. Uh, he's brought home safely and, and well. Uh, he's given us wisdom beyond our own for the challenges that life brings to us. So we give him praise for these things and all of his blessings. Um, ironically, praise also reinforces our confidence in prayer, in coming to God with our needs, and so we do that as well today. There are still many traveling from our church family for lots of different reasons. Uh, we need to keep them in our prayers. Many who are struggling with health issues, uh, Dean Life, Paul Kellogg, Annette Wittenberg, Jack Coleman, pray for them and for others. Uh, there are many suffering because of natural disasters. Uh, the, the fires out in California continue near to home. Of course, the flooding down in eastern Kentucky. Uh, we, we know that Oakdale, uh, our school down in Jackson, is, is fine. Uh, I'm not sure how the Lord has, uh, has done that. They sit in a valley, you know, but the Lord has spared them. Um, the, our church in Elkata it, just up the street from Oakdale, they were uh, flooded, at least their basement was, and so keep them uh, in your prayers. Uh, there's teams going out this week, pray for them on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, they will be working with New Hope, uh, that's the ministry that Roy Water and the different churches there, so uh, they'll headquarter in Campton, I think, and then go uh, from there each day. So uh, if, if the weather allows and if uh, we're allowed to get in, uh, and, and do some work, uh, pray for those teams. Uh, we should pray, too, for the lawlessness in our cities. Uh, there's plenty uh, that we could pray for. I wonder if, if the churches in our land just began to pray for these big cities that are struggling so much. I wonder what the Lord might do. Uh, let's do our part and pray for them. Uh, you have concerns on your heart, as do I. Uh, and this altar is a place to bring those concerns. Uh, it just lets the rest of us know that we can say an extra prayer for you. Uh, we may not know all that you're dealing with or going through, but we can name you to the Lord in prayer. So if you'd like to come and pray at the altar, why don't you come on up while we sing. Our call to prayer, uh, if you need the words, they're printed there in the worship guide. Okay, let's sing and then uh, I'll lead us in prayer this morning. Father, first of all, we do want to acknowledge and confess that you are God. Uh, 
you are not our buddy. Uh, you are not some sort of personal, spiritual vending machine in the sky. You are nothing less than the high and holy maker and sustainer of all that is. Uh, you are the alpha and the omega. You're the beginning and the end of us and of, and of all that is and has ever been. You are great and mighty. You are all-knowing. You are all-seeing. You are all-powerful. God, we bow before you here today because you are worthy of all of our reverence and praise. And at the same time, you are our loving Heavenly Father who is with us even here and now as we worship and, and, and who is with your people everywhere, all around the world in this very same moment. You are listening to us and you are listening to them. You care about us. You care about them. It is your deepest desire to give us your very best. It is your deepest desire to give all people your very best. You look out for us. You warn all who will read through your word and all who will listen to the voice of your spirit. You show us the way to go and the path to walk and the steps to take, not for your vanity, not for your ego, but amazingly, because you love us with all your heart. We know you are here in this place. You are here in this moment. Fact is, there's no place we can go to hide from you, even if we wanted to. You're the God who sees, and you're the God who sees us as we really are. You know the pains we bear, you know the struggles we have, you know our thoughts, you know our dreams, you know our successes, you know our failures, you know our motivations, you know us better than we know ourselves. And if it weren't for your grace embodied in your son, Jesus Christ, all that you know about us would scare us to death. But instead, because of what Jesus did for us, you welcome us to yourself. Scars and all. You welcome us to heal us and to heal those we love. And all we have to do is speak your name and you hear us. So Lord, we come to you for healing today. And we bring those we love to you and those situations that concern us. Uh, Father, we do pray for all those who are sick, those we named we pray for those who are hurt. We pray for those who are lonely, those who are fearful, and those who are lost. We pray for those suffering because of these tremendous fires in California, for those suffering because of the violence in our cities and the tribal anger between peoples and nations. Father, we pray for our friends and neighbors close to home here who are suffering because of the flooding in our state. Lord, would you have mercy upon them? And would you use us to help in any way you choose? There is much wrong in our world, and we need you. And we ask for your grace and your hand to help us. Holy Spirit, would you come this day and guide those who will listen to you? Give strength to the weak and wisdom to the struggling, direction to the lost, mercy to the broken. Just as your prophet Amos prayed, we pray that your justice would roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Because only you can save our world. Only you can bring good. Only you can answer the prayers that we pray. Father, would you do that? Would you help us be your people, your people of love and confidence and hope? all for your glory. Lord, hear our prayers this morning. Uh, those who sit, those who kneel at the altar, hear our prayers and receive our worship as our honest gift to you this day. We pray because of Jesus, in his grace, in his amazing love, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Colin McLaughlin, and I will be reading the scripture this morning. If you are able, please stand as I read God's word. The scripture is from Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. The word of the Lord came to me. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the firstfruits of his harvest. All who devoured her were held guilty, and disaster overtook them, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, you descendants of Jacob, all you clans of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your ancestors find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines, a land of drought and utter darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives? I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce. But you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by, prophesied by Baal following worthless idols. Therefore, I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord, and I will bring charges against your children's children. Cross over to the coasts of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are no gods at all. But my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Children, this is your time if you want to join me up here. Okay, have any of you guys ever had a friend that you were really close with and then you ended up not being as close with that friend anymore because of them moving or you moving or you had a fight or something like that? Yeah, that's relatable. Good. So that's kind of what that Bible verse was talking about, but with God and God's people, they were really close and then something happened and they weren't as close anymore because the people chose um, different friends, different people, different things, selfish things. And sometimes that happens. But I want to teach you a really big word. Can you say reconciliation? Does anyone know what that word means? Good. So reconciliation means when you bring something back together for good. So that's what God wants, and that's what he wants from that Bible verse. So um, there are things that, you know, happen in our lives that separate us from God's love, whether we would rather choose to spend time watching TV than listening to, um, you know, what God wants to say to us in our prayers or doing different things that avoid spending time with God. And so God wants us to come back to him and choose things that help us to be close to him. But he also wants that for our friendships and our relationships, too. Um, but the good thing about the word reconciliation is that it can happen at any time. So even if you realize now there's things that I need to do to go back closer to God, you can make that choice now, and he's happy to have you um, make those decisions and come back closer to him. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for these kiddos um, and their willingness to learn and their willingness to um, just come and be here and be a part of your story. We ask that you bless them and bless their day and help them to make choices to be closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. If you are grade or age four through third grade, you can go to children's worship.
like to have one from every family every week. Let us know how we can be praying for you and what joys we can be celebrating with you and your family as the week comes through, goes through. Uh, you can drop that completed card in the offering boxes out in the foyer when you leave here this morning. And if you are a guest with us today, this is your first time here, you're looking for a home church, we would love for you to complete that card as well. But instead of placing it in the offering boxes in the foyer, would you take it to the Welcome Center out there? We have a gift out there that we would like to be able to give to you, and that would give us a great opportunity to do that. There are quite a few announcements of things that are happening over the next several weeks listed in the worship folder. The ministry fair is still going on out in the foyer. If you are not uh, serving anywhere in the church currently or you'd like to serve in an additional place, would you consider stopping by the ministry fair there and see the different areas of ministry where we still need people to plug in and serve and prayerfully consider how God wants you to be a part of those different ministries. Later on this week, on Wednesday, we have two opportunities for prayer. One is at 12 o'clock here in the sanctuary, and then at 7 o'clock in the evening, we will all meet over in Building C. The youth and the adults will meet there as we pray for our schools. You can come and help us pray for our public schools and our private schools and our local, local uh, uh, college and university and seminary as they begin school this, this year. Also, as Pastor Darrell mentioned later this week, August 3rd and the Fourth, the Wednesday and Thursday, if we're able to, we are going to send teams to Eastern Kentucky to work there with uh, flood relief. If you are interested in being a part of that team or would like to find out more, you can either contact Keith Medill or indicate uh, flood relief on your communication card, and we will be in contact with you about that. You should know that the church has uh, given the benevolence team has approved giving $5,000 to Bear Pen Church out there in eastern Kentucky to use toward flood relief. This is the same church that we sent a mission team to earlier this year to, to work. So uh, we have given them that money to help them in, in flood relief as they, as they find people in need in their ministry area there. On August the 14th, we are having our annual baptism. If you have accepted Christ and have not as your Savior and have not yet been baptized and would like to like to be baptized, would you indicate that on your communication card? Just write baptism, and we will be in contact with you about that as well. This evening at 6 o'clock, we will gather here again for worship. I encourage you to come and be a part of that. The Bible Quizzers will be giving us an update about their teams and the things that they've gone through this year, and several awards will be given out to, to different ones on the Bible Quiz team. So would you come and support them as they, as they uh, tell us more about their ministry? And then also Nancy Elwood will be speaking this evening. So would you come and hear what God wants to tell us through her? salvation whom shall I fear whom shall I fear the Lord is my light and my salvation to you I'll be near to you I'll be near Though host camp against me, still my heart will not fear. Though the war be against me, it's your voice I will hear. And in the day of trouble, you will answer me, setting my feet high on a rock. Of my enemy, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my light and my salvation. To you I'll be near, to you I'll be near. One thing I will ask of you, 
that I will see, that I may dwell in your house each day of the week, to behold the beauty and the glory of the Lord, and to meditate daily. Thank you, Kevin. I wish I could play the guitar. I, I did. I really did. I started taking lessons in college, and then I, I hurt my hand, and that ended the lessons, and I never went back. I wish I could play the guitar. It's beautiful. We are in Jeremiah chapter 2, if you want to turn back there. Uh, Jeremiah, the second chapter. You have heard the phrase, the honeymoon period. And you know what that means, right? Uh, it's applied to jobs. It's applied to partnerships, to friendships. Uh, it's applied to teams or clubs or even churches that you might join and, and become a part of, the relationships there. Anywhere, actually anywhere, there is a human-to-human -human relationship involved, you can have a honeymoon, period. Uh, and what that is, is that initial time in that relationship when everything is young and fresh and exciting. Uh, it's a time when all of the warts are either ignored or they haven't been noticed yet. Uh, or they're intentionally overlooked. Um, and as long as that lasts, the honeymoon period, it's great, right? It's great. The problem is, of course, that it doesn't last all that long. Honeymoon periods. Eventually, friends have differences that can't just be ignored and, and they have to be worked through and that's not always easy. That takes some struggle. And eventually, your business partner and you have a disagreement about how to move forward in this endeavor that you're a part of. And eventually, the boss makes you do something you don't really want to do. But you have to do it anyway if you want to keep your job. And eventually, you find that the club or the team or the church that you joined isn't quite as perfect as you thought it was at first, and that is the end of the honeymoon period. Uh, now, of course, this whole idea came from marriage. By the way, let me say congratulations to Earl and Dottie Bowen. This bouquet on the communion table represents uh, 57 years of marriage that Earl and Dottie have been married. So uh, this was Earl's gift to Dottie. This is the only gift he gave her, <laughs> was these flowers. <laughs> And the honeymoon isn't over yet, right? Well, it might be now, <laughs> but it, it isn't over yet. The whole idea of the honeymoon period, it comes from marriage, where the actual honeymoon ends, and the couple comes back to normal life, life that is not all mountains and beaches and candlelight dinners and exotic loveliness, right? And in that normal life, when that couple begin running into problems, that's when the marital honeymoon can end. <laughs> you've, heard, you've heard the old joke about the stages of marriage as they relate to the wife having a cold, right? Here's a vivid description of the end of the honeymoon. 
Okay, In the first year of marriage, when the wife gets a cold, the husband responds to her illness like this. He says, oh, sugar dumpling, I'm worried about my baby girl. You have a bad sniffle, so I'm going to carry you to the hospital so you can get a checkup and get some rest there. And, and listen, I know the food is not going to be very good there at the hospital, so I'm going to bring you every meal from the really nice restaurant right down the street. That's in the first year. In the second year, year of marriage when the wife gets a cold. The husband says, darling, I don't really like the sound of that cough. So I've called Dr. Miller. He's coming here. Now you go on to bed and, and I'll just take care of everything. In the third year when the wife gets a cold, honey, maybe you need to lie down because there's nothing like some rest when you feel badly. So I'll bring you something to eat. Do we have any canned soup in the house? In the fourth year. Now look, dear, be sensible. After you've fed the kids and done the dishes and cleaned the floor, you better go lie down. <laughs> the fifth year, why don't you take a couple aspirin? <laughs> the sixth year, I wish you'd take a pill or something instead of sitting around barking like a seal. <laughs> the seventh year, for Pete's sake, stop sneezing. Are you trying to give me pneumonia? <laughs> That's a picture of a honeymoon that has ended, right? There's another picture of an ended honeymoon here in, in this passage of Jeremiah. Uh, and to understand it, you have to understand a little bit of the scene. In Jeremiah's day, Israel had long been split into two separate nations, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had already fallen. It had been taken over by the Assyrians in 721. And Judah... The southern kingdom, Jeremiah's home, was a mess. And it was in danger of falling itself to a foreign power. You can read all about that in 2 Kings 22, 2 Chronicles 34. But the short of it is, those days were bad days. They were bad days spiritually. They were bad days morally. Idolatry was rampant. God had long been neglected in Judah. But just the same... In those days, two important things happened. First, God called Jeremiah to begin preaching. And second, God raised up Josiah to be the king. He took Judah's throne when he was only eight years old. Josiah. He was not like most of his nation. He was not like his predecessors who had the throne before him. Josiah loved God and he wanted his people to come to repentance. And so he began several national spiritual initiatives, including the rebuilding of the temple, which had been grossly neglected and used for other things. And amazingly, in the middle of that rebuilding process of the temple, the book of God's law was found. The scripture, it had been lost in the temple. That would be like the church completely forgetting that the Bible exists. Can you imagine? Sure you can. Sure you can. There are local churches where that is the reality today. But there in the temple, when they realized what they'd found, they began to read it. <laughs> and Josiah, they called the people to listen to it. And out of that public reading of Scripture, the rediscovered law, this revival began that helped the nation to endure. But you see, God had already been working in Judah because about five years before all that, he called this Jeremiah to begin preaching, which is what we have here in chapter 2, the beginning of Jeremiah's preaching. This is his first message after his commission from God, and this is pretty good, right? God told him exactly what to say. And so Jeremiah's first sermon was printed in the best-selling book of all time. That's pretty good. And he starts off positively. He commends Israel's early love for God. Back in Egypt, you know, back in the desert, he reminds them of how committed they were to following God's ways. And, and he says, well, you avoided idolatry. You managed to keep the temptation of neighboring peoples at bay. You kept them away from the way that you lived. They did as God told them to do 
in those early years in the wilderness. And they made consistent progress toward their promised land. We talked all about that a couple weeks ago. God asked for this covenant relationship. God asked to be married to Israel at Mount Sinai. And Israel said, yes. And accepting a couple small interruptions, Israel followed God faithfully all through that wilderness experience. Israel kept her promise to God and God kept his promises to Israel. And things went well for everybody, you see. This is the sort of relationship God wants with people, all people. It's what he made you for. It's what he made me for, a relationship of delight with him. He wants to lead us into peace and joy and satisfaction and fulfillment and, and purpose. The one who made us wants to walk through life with us and share with us and provide for us and help us and protect us. He wants nothing less than a marriage relationship. And he wants that honeymoon between himself and his people to keep on going and going and going. He wanted that for Israel. The excitement and, and the happiness and the contentment and the commitment that comes with marriage. All that, that appears so naturally when love is young. God wanted all of that to continue. Because you see, where God is concerned, honeymoons need not last only for a limited time. But, of course, sadly, heartbreakingly for God, his honeymoon with Israel ended because of Israel's unfaithfulness. Surprisingly quickly, actually. And for this, Jeremiah begins critiquing his people. In verse 5, he begins speaking for God. God says, tell the people this. So Jeremiah begins describing Israel's rejection of God with this remarkable question there in verse 5. What fault did your ancestors find in me? that they strayed so far from me. Think about that for a minute. It's, it's really a shocking statement. Imagine the creator God asking his creation, what's so wrong with me that would cause you to leave me? Now, it's rhetorical, of course. And after asking it, he goes on to reiterate all that he had done for them there in verse 6. All this that they'd apparently forgotten about. You know, God says, Israel didn't even consider. Where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and ravines and land of drought and utter darkness, a land where nobody travels and nobody lives? Where is the Lord who brought us into this fertile land? to eat its fruits and rich produce. See, the people didn't even consider him. The people didn't remember him, neither did the leaders, Jeremiah says, the very people who were supposed to remember. In verse 8 there, even the priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal following worthless idols, those who were supposed to remember and to call the people to remember God, they failed to do it. Everybody forgot him. And so the honeymoon was over. And it's so disappointing and it's so frustrating to God. You can hear it in his words. He's sad. He's, he's perplexed. He's, he's angry. It's as if God said, you know, I love you so well. How senseless could you be <laughs> to neglect and ignore and leave me? Look what he says there in verse 10. He challenges him. He begins challenging him. Cross over to the coast of Cyprus and look. Send, send to Kedar and observe closely. See if there's ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever traded its gods, yet they're not gods at all? It's, he's inviting his people to look as far as they can look to the west. Look as far as you can look to the east. See if you can find a people anywhere who would give up the one who loved them so well. And for what? For the sake of 
worthless idols. Verse 12 there, the heavens are shocked at such a thing. They shrink back in horror and dismay over such. So unbelievable it is, you see, that a people would walk away from their first love, from the love of their youth, the love who had been so good and so faithful. They would walk away from him. And for what? For nothing. For worthless, powerless statues, idols. In, in Israel's giving up of Yahweh, they'd made an absolutely terrible trade, you see. Do you know what people say the worst trade in the history of sports was? In January 1920, the owner of the Boston Red Sox, Harry Frazee, traded Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees for $100,000 and for the ability to secure a $300,000 loan to finance a musical. The title of the musical was No, No, Nanette. Anybody remember it? <laughs> of course you don't. It was a colossal flop. But you've heard of Babe Ruth, haven't you? Because he and the Yankees went on to absolutely dominate baseball for the next 20 years. And the Red Sox won absolutely nothing. Now, anybody with any sense at all knows that was a bad trade. But Israel's trade was way worse than that. Verse 13 there. In what Israel did, God says, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they've dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, that can't hold water. Two sins. They forsake the true God. They invented their own God. They traded the spring of living water, he says, for cisterns. Cisterns that they had to create. And cisterns that would never, never work. Now, can you see the power in this description? God, Yahweh, Israel's first love, Jeremiah, names him here for the very first time, the spring or the fountain of living water. We, we, that is familiar to us because of these words in Jeremiah. But that's who God is. That's who he was to Israel. It's sort of like the overflowing cup in Psalm 23. You know, God is the creator of water. He's the provider of water. He's where water and everything else comes from. It flows out of him without any work at all on our part. That is Israel's God. But they rejected him and they traded him for cisterns. Now, you know what a cistern is? It's a tank that holds water, usually underground. It has to be, be made, first of all. And in Jeremiah's day, they had to, usually they chiseled them out of rock. So it's not an easy thing to make. So, so first somebody has to, a cistern, somebody first has to make it. And then water that has to be found somewhere has to be transported to where the cistern is and then dumped into the cistern or pumped into the cistern for storage. And then when the water is needed, it has to be pumped out of the cistern again. You see the difference in this image. Water just flows from a spring, from a fountain. A fountain requires nothing of us. But a cistern is a man-made container for water that we have to find. Israel made that trade, a spring for a cistern, and a broken cistern at that, a cistern that wouldn't work, wouldn't hold water. Now, that's a clear enough image for us, but it was even more startling for Jeremiah's original hearers because, you know, they were people who lived in a semi-arid land. Water was prized there, and thirst was very common. So how utterly absurd of them to trade the source of all that is precious and rare and life-giving in order to have to cut themselves cisterns and then find themselves water to fill them. Water that becomes dirty and unpredictable and that leaks out 
and disappears. How senseless to make such a choice and how disappointing and how sad to God that they did, that they left what was so good for something that was so broken. How disappointing and sad to God that they gave up a way that works for a way that doesn't work. How disappointing and sad to God that his people chose worthless over worthy. And actually, the circumstances were worse than just disappointing and sad because, you see, here's the thing. Broken cisterns kill their makers. Broken cisterns kill their makers. Nobody carves a cistern and expects it to not work. So you, you carve your cistern, you make your cistern, you fill it with water, and you expect to find the water there when you need the water. But you only find out your cistern doesn't work after it's too late. After you've filled it, and you go away, and the water leaks out. And when you come back to get the water that you need, and you find it's gone, that's when you realized, oh no. By the time you realize your cistern's broken, it's too late. Broken cisterns kill their makers because they can't provide the water they need when they need it. Broken sisters, cisterns also disappoint those who search because broken cisterns promise more than they wind up being able to deliver. Uh, people come to them expecting to find water there, but when they open them, they find dust. Broken cisterns kill those who make them, those who trade for them, and they disappoint those who search for water, but more than water. Those who search for truth, those who search for this thirst that they have within them to be quenched. I'm missing something in life. What is it? I'll look here because it promises, this cistern promises to give me what I lack. And they look and they try it and it's empty. God's people had traded the worthy for the worthless. And Jeremiah says there in verse 5, in that choice, in their trade, they became worthless themselves. What's that mean? It means that when someone trades God in for useless knowledge, useless wisdom, useless principles, useless morals, not only does that person himself or herself self-destruct, but anybody who comes to that person looking for wisdom or knowledge or anything else, they don't find it. They don't find it. They fail as examples, they fail as teachers, they fail as leaders because they've got nothing of substance to offer, you see. And when that happens to leaders, they put whole families, whole churches, whole communities, and whole nations at risk. Everything becomes warped. Nothing works right. Truth is skewed. Principles are diminished. Priorities are misplaced. And everybody begins to be affected. Everybody begins to suffer. Trading away Babe Ruth ruined the Red Sox for decades. Trading away God ruins individuals and families and communities Nations, potentially, for ages and ages. Israel experienced it. Israel is a perfect example of it. They experienced this sort of progressive deterioration, down and down. She fell further and further and further into sin and all the despair and all the suffering that accompanies sin. And she didn't even realize it. Israel didn't realize how bad off she was. Jeremiah was shocked at the blindness of these people at how mindlessly and thoughtlessly and yet passionately they chased after broken cisterns. <laughs> things that didn't work. Things that were contributing to their own destruction. Does that not sound so much like our nation and our culture today? 
how passionately our world pursues the eradication of God. And in doing so, we are desperately trying to build our own cisterns that will surely kill us and all who come after us. And, and how wise so many think they are in their attempts to do things that are so foolish. In his book, Murder in the Cathedral, T.S. Eliot observes how only the fool, fixed in his folly, may think he can turn the wheel on which he turns. Now, you ready for some good news? <laughs> God used Jeremiah and God used Josiah to bring at least a partial awakening to Israel about her situation. It wasn't a great awakening, but it was a good awakening. So we might wonder, will there be a Jeremiah and a Josiah to help us? It's hard to say. We can't say. The better question might be this. If you want to ask a question, ask this question. Am I personally chasing after with all my heart the fountain of living water or am I wasting my time building leaking cisterns? In my life, in your life, in my life, in what I think, what I value, in my priorities, have I traded the fountain for a broken cistern? Am I chasing after other lovers? Or am I embracing the love of my youth, the one who loved me so well? There's only one way that works. There's only one path that leads to success eternally. Stay faithful to Jesus. Stay faithful to his ways. Stay faithful to the love you enjoyed with him when you first met him. If you've strayed from him, return to him while you can. Today is the day of salvation. If you have strayed from him, return to him. He will receive you. And he will, once again, give you living water for your good and, and for his glory. Father, thank you for this word that you gave to Jeremiah that still speaks powerfully today. Thank you for the grace that we see in all of this. Even then, you were calling your people back to yourself. You were inviting them, and the same is true today. You invite us to yourself. Those who have walked away from you, those who have made a bad trade somewhere back in their life. Lord, would you help us to stay true to you, to our first love, and help those who have made a bad trade to return to you. Thank you for the mercy and the grace that you've made available to us that makes redemption possible, that makes the, the undoing of bad trades possible so that we can live truly with the spring of living water. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna sing a couple verses of a song. I don't know which one. I presume Rose will tell us in a minute. But if you have made a bad trade and you would like to return to Christ, this is your opportunity. You can come kneel at this altar. Uh, you can make an altar where you are and ask the Lord to restore you. Uh, but don't, don't give up. Don't give up on that bad trade. Okay? Today is the day that it can be made right. Number 364 is our song of response. My Jesus, I love thee. We'll sing all the stanzas that are marked with the little arrows beside of them. It's one, two, and four. 364, if you can, would you stand with me as we sing it?
If you have never yet traded away Jesus, your first love, the love of your youth, uh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And may that love and that commitment between you and the Lord always be a honeymoon. Okay? Uh, if you have traded him away, I urge you, get rid of the empty cisterns in your life. Repent of that sin and ask Jesus to return to that place of, of first love. And if you've never yet received Jesus, would you today be sure that you do today invite him to become that true and first love? The Lord is faithful. He never forsakes his own. Never forsakes his own. Thanks for coming to worship. The Lord bless and keep you.